When the 90s X-Men cartoon first debuted, it started with the Sentinels. I mean, that only makes sense, right? Obviously, the X-Men have a ton of adversaries, but what enemy would you want to ease them into the concepts of your story? What better than the machines that humanity creates to eradicate the mutants? The third episode would introduce Magneto and Sabretooth, yes, but the struggle between humanity and mutant kind continued for the entire story. It is charged with a simple felony. You're denying him bail just because he's a mutant. Season 1 ends with the Days of Future Past arc, a story that showcases an apocalyptic future where humanity dooms itself with mutant extermination camps following the assassination of Senator Kelly. Though the X-Men cartoon would showcase all sorts of adversaries, from the cosmic to the apocalyptic, the show would end with, once again, humanity as the adversary. With Henry Gyrick assassinating, or at least seemingly assassinating, Professor Charles Xavier. In an inverse of the Days of Future Past arc, we see that this assassination brings in an era of peace for mutant kind, where heroes and villains unite under a common banner. The show ends with hope. That is until 2024, when X-Men 97, a continuation of this original series, debuts, and we are reintroduced to the X-Men of this universe with the Sentinels. Again. Humanity's bigotry towards mutants guides the entirety of X-Men 97's first season. <laughs> Did you honestly think we'd roll over and let mutants take over the planet? So we might wear tolerance on our sleeves, but we know the naked truth. Tolerance is extinction. We start with the return of the Sentinels, progress to Magneto's trial, and Storm's depowering at the hands of the Executioner. You build robots who hunt us, callers to chain our power. Humanity must protect itself. Protection. That is extermination. We then proceed to witness mutant experimentation with Sinister exploitation of minorities with Storm and Forge. I left the government by then. You, of all people, should know the perils of trusting those in Washington. And ultimately, witness genocide in Genosha. We are confronted with a world where even the heroes, like Captain America, seem hesitant to help mutant kind. This uniform shows up in Mexico bashing heads in with you. It sends a message. That you stand with mutants. Unless you don't now. And then we learn the mastermind behind it all is a sentinel. Bastion, the first prime sentinel who has traveled back in time in order to overtake humanity, hollowing people out and replacing them with hate-filled machines designed only to exterminate. Overload their bandwidth. Too much to compute. Because when your skin's not in the game, apathy's your answer. It's hard not to see all of that and think of it as an allegory for the radicalization of bigotry, for people who listen to hateful rhetoric until it hollows them out, destroying all quality of life, leaving you as a hateful machine for cruelty, creating a future where mankind has become dominant species, enslaving all that is different. The only cost, a soul, individuality, identity. X-Men 97 asks the question, what happens if humanity fears being replaced so much that they create their own replacement? It's like this scary ozone stuff in the news. Act today to save tomorrow. Anyone who has listened to right-wing rhetoric knows this is a satirization of the rhetoric we see on Fox News, on Breitbart, on Daily Wire, on whatever choice right-wing media platform you're thinking of. I know that the left and all the little gatekeepers on Twitter become literally hysterical if you use the term replacement, if you suggest that the Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the voters now casting mm. ballots, with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. Let's just say it, that's mm. true. I mean, everyone wants to make a racial issue out of it. Ooh, the, you know, white replacement theory. No, no, no. Great replacement theory is the belief that minorities in America will surpass the white population turning the once majority into a minority in the country that the white people stole from Native American tribes. I mean, uh, sorry, uh, their nation under God, where freedom reigns and all that. In a hundred years, mutants outnumber humans 10 to 1. 
And generations later, human extinction. Land of tolerance, land of the free. I first saw her in 1949. America was going to be the land of tolerance. Peace. But the people who often say this are only fearing receiving the same treatment that they dealt onto others this entire time. In a lot of ways, people seem to really enjoy this new X-Men 97 series. It's really reinvigorated the X-Men in a dozen different ways, in part because it showcases that something that most X-Men adaptations have not shown before have been afraid to commit to. Humanity is kind of the worst. Vogue, what have you done? What we all wanted to do. There have been several X-Men movies between the 90s animated series and the X-Men 97 revival. That's a trilogy of trilogies, two Deadpool films, Dark Phoenix, and The New Mutants. Now, I didn't bother watching New Mutants, so I can't speak to its quality, but no one else watched it either, so I'm not worried here with this discussion. Of the remaining films, only two movies deal with humanity's bigotry towards mutants. X2 and Logan. Or rather, two movies are entirely about humanity's bigotry. Because, after all, other films reference it, but they're not about it. Oh, it's not so surprising, really. Mankind has always feared what it doesn't understand. First Class in the original X-Men film showcased bigotry in a distant sort of way, as a response to mutant antics more than anything else. We see Senator Kelly give speeches and a Mutant Registration Act proposed, which is obviously awful, but the main focus of the film is on Magneto and the Brotherhood. They, not humanity, are the primary threat. Let them pass that law and they'll have you in chains with a number burned into your forehead. It won't be that way. Then kill me and find out. First Class shows the CIA being skeptical of mutants, but for the most part, they're welcoming. At least, the ones we talk to are welcoming. Bigotry is always a lurking constant behind the scenes in X-Men First Class. The bad guys are the Hellfire Club, which we learn are run by mutants who want to take over the world. The whole climax of the film focuses on Magneto and Professor X fighting each other on how to present themselves to humanity. Now, both are great films, the original and First Class, but humanity isn't the primary threat in either, though they are omnipresent. Killing will not bring you peace. Peace was never an option. Days of Future Past, however, again, seems like a film that illustrates humanity's cruelty. We see them build the Sentinels, and these Sentinels eradicate humanity and mutant kind. But why do I not think that Days of Future Past deals with human bigotry the same way that X2 or Logan do? Well, the final conflict of Days of Future Past, the film, ultimately becomes, once again, stopping Magneto and presenting mutant kind's best face to humanity to show the world they're not a threat. And while Days of Future Past is a great film, there's a clear trend among the three films I just discussed. Mutants have to stop other mutants in order to convince mankind that they're good. All those years wasted fighting each other, Charles. To have a precious few of them back. Neither X2 or Logan seem to believe that this is something that should be done. Have you tried not being a mutant? In both films, humanity is the primary threat. The finale of each film focuses on stopping mankind's awful work. In X2, William Stryker tries to eradicate mutant kind using experimented upon mutants that he has shackled to his will. Who am I? You are just a failed experiment. <laughs> We learn Stryker is responsible for Weapon X, the process that turned Logan into an adamantium weapon. People don't change, Wolverine. You're an animal then, you're an animal now. I just gave you claws. And we later, and we later see Stryker has used his own son as a weapon, mind-controlling mutants, so mutants have to fight each other. But ultimately, mankind pulls the strings. While in later films we see Stryker played by younger actors, Nowhere is he as overtly bigoted or as overtly cruel as he is here, nor is he a central threat. In fact, often he's a distant background character. Or, at the very least, pushing events so that mutants, 
again, but pitted against mutants. One day, someone will finish what I've started, Wolverine! One day! Ultimately, we are given no good human to watch in X2. See, you're not the only one that's been enhanced. In Logan, mutants have already been eradicated, for the most part, using genetic modification, thanks to Nathaniel Essex, aka Sinister, whose presence is only referenced thanks to the enigmatic Essex Corp that appears in this film, X-Men Apocalypse, and Deadpool 2. The goal of Logan and the cast of Logan? Survive. There's no hope of acceptance, there's no chance of victory, there's just living from one day to the next. But I did neglect one film that I think is rather interesting. The Wolverine. In The Wolverine, humanity fetishizes mutants, but in a sick, toxic way. Take what you would not give and transfer your unwanted healing to my body. The Silver Samurai is not one of the more fondly remembered adversaries in the X-Men film series, but the idea of a man who has convinced himself that mutants are a gift and seeks to become one to the point where he's willing to take the blood and genetics of a mutant just to get that, that's fairly disturbing. Your mistake was to believe that a life without end can have no meaning. It is the only life that can. In fact, you could even say it sounds like a horror film. Why black people? People want to change. Some people want to be stronger, faster, cooler. Black is in fashion. No, you're in vogue, Storm. Most of these X-Men films focus on mutant on mutant conflict. So it might seem odd that the animated series puts so much focus on humanity's bigotries, except no, not really, it isn't. Even ignoring the fact that we've received tons of fights with the Brotherhood of Mutants and the X-Men over the years, even ignoring the fact that we've done Dark Phoenix, Apocalypse, all that in the previous five seasons of X-Men, the message needs to be ironed in for people to fully understand it. Know what I hate about your kind? You act like you got it so bad. Normal people have it hard too. Harder. It's staggering how many people heard Executioner say this and agreed with him. Know what I hate about your kind? You can also recognize that the movies are made today because the villains are so freaking relatable, right? Like propaganda talking points over and over and over to the point where whatever they look, they see those propaganda points and, and they try to force them in whether it makes fit or not. Like, the thing with X-Men, okay, I actually spoke with one of the people involved in its creation. I'm pretty sure that everyone knows Ethan Van Skyver, like I was... Or at least, it would be staggering if it was so unsurprising. To a troubling degree, the media kind of joined in the celebration. I, mean, I was watching MSNBC for hours, and gay commentators and gay actors and gay celebrities, just a steady parade with barely a nod to the notion that there was another side in this 5-4 decision. Criticizing the visibility of minorities is a commonplace tactic in today's landscape, especially by those who fear they are being replaced by the presence of others who are different from them. There's a new study of those folks charged in the Capitol attack found that fear of the great replacement may have been a prime driver, concluding that replacement theory might help explain why such a high percentage of riders hail from counties with fast-rising non-white populations. In 100 years, mutants outnumber humans 10 to 1. If you're watching this video and heard what I'm saying about being replaced, you probably thought of internet drama, of people getting angry at woke films for putting black people or women or gay characters front and center. But the disturbing reality is that this extends far, far beyond just media consumption. This girl here was the first Negro, apparently, of high school age to show up at Central High School the day that a federal court ordered it integrated. She was followed in front of the school by an angry crowd, many of them shouting epithets at her. And you see lines of white people lined up around the, around the streets, around the sidewalks, screaming. Well, these people who had come in from other parts of the state, uh, other states. Shouting 
protesting. You see so much rage, so much hatred, and for what? A girl going to school. That's it. Just getting an education like everyone else. And that's, that's enough to get you enraged? Or is it the fact that it's like everyone else? And then you think about the rage spent about gays in the military back in the 90s, about trans bathrooms today. These are such minor things. You're angry about people participating in society, and these people just happen to be born different than you. What, what does this rage amount to? What are you getting out of it? What's the end result? Well, what it amounts to ultimately is cruelty. The cruelty is the point. You see them channeling their sense of inferiority, these sense of insecurity out on other people because it makes them feel stronger, makes them feel more, more important. It establishes a pecking order that they are afraid they are not on top of, and they cannot imagine functioning in a society where they are not catered to at all times. This is a voting rights question. I have less political power because they're importing a brand new electorate. Why should I sit back and take that? The power that I have yeah. as an American guaranteed at birth is one man, one vote, and they're diluting it. But you see the justifications for it all the time. You see these people claim that minorities are here to deconstruct the grand history of Western civilization, alluding to, again, a time where they weren't present in your Western civilization, which is simply not the case. Um, but you want to believe that's the case. This merits rage, this merits anger, this merits fury, and this rage and anger becomes all-consuming until a person is hollowed out, replaced again by the mechanics of bigotry, by the mechanics of hatred. Before today, this fellow was your average Joe. With all this mutant loving, people like Joe turn to dial-up chat rooms to speak freely, to connect. Of course, the X-Men films show this too. So do all iterations of X-Men. We see bigotry and hatred from the people the X-Men save. But what's different about X-Men 97 is that we see something else too. That humanity isn't just anti-mutant. It's that everyone else doesn't seem to care enough to do anything in any meaningful fashion. Do not mistake Doom's collusion as indifference to flagrant war crimes. And of course, this begs the question, why is it that characters like Steve Rogers get a free pass from society while mutants don't? What makes a man modified by a super soldier serum any different from someone born with mutant abilities? And there is no good answer. They're just accepted differently in, in society. They are people who, are, who elevate themselves, not necessarily someone elevated by nature. By the way, if you're Logan, I'm your backup. I'm Captain America. Really? I never would have guessed. Because it's not simply enough that hatred is coming at a minority group. It's also that no one is there to help. And that's the part that X-Men 97 captures perfectly. Because at the end of each X-Men film, we set feel a sense of optimism about the future. The the future is bright. You know, mankind and mutants, they can come together and form a beautiful, beautiful future. Except for Logan, which ends with the most cruel, blunt, possible dosage of reality. That sometimes someone can push the bar so far that there is no going back. There is no hope. There is a point from which you cannot return or cannot hope for a better tomorrow. Just a tomorrow at all. But X-Men 97, week to week, leaves audiences feeling dragged to the emotional ringer. It feels like each episode that the situation is more dire than the previous episode. No matter how many incredible feats of, of, of mutant powers are demonstrated, or how many cool times Nightcrawler teleports through space and time, no matter what Magneto does or says, no matter what Rogue does or says, no matter how cool Cyclops is, there is no better tomorrow despite the fact the characters are fighting for it. As a boy, my people's homes were burned to ash because we dared to call God by another name. Then my people hunted me with those who had once hunted them. I promised a boy a future free of fear, only to watch his frightened eyes be 
vaporized inside his tiny skull. It, it leaves you with the feeling that things will never actually get better. And in fact, things are only going to get worse. We started the show with mutants being celebrated by the media only to learn that celebration was skin deep. As Gyrick says, No, you're in vogue, Storm. There's not an actual tangible desire to help. And once the veneer of acceptance is dropped, you realize how superficial that initial acceptance was to begin with. Overload their bandwidth. Too much to compute. Because when your skin's not in the game, apathy's your answer. At this point, the entire world can be overtaken by robots, as we're seeing, and humanity just shrugs it off because it's happening to someone else. Because the violence is happening to someone else. Because I have to stomach your questions and prove that I'm a person. I lie because the truth is we're nothing like you. Thank God, because it's the only reason you people are still alive. Even humanity's performative action in the face of Genosha's tragedy is satirized. While the X-Men give interviews for puff pieces illustrating that mutants' acceptance is up, their people are terminated. I came here today to give the X-Men a chance to show the world that mutants are just like us. People. Normal. And you lie. And then when the media comes back, they blame the mutants or act like it's the mutants that drew this violence towards them. Victim blaming at its finest. It's hard not to look at this, then turn to the multiple media outlets where people give themselves a pat on the back for stopping oppression. I can understand why many people celebrated the Supreme Court's ruling on same-sex marriage. Now, I think over the years, uh, the press has played a role in the shifting of public opinion. The, fo the focus would be the camera would zero in on happy couples. This kind of put a human face and turned it from an abstract political debate into a human interest story. But at the same time, even though 60% now favor this, that means 40% of the country is against it. While well, violence happens, just outside their view. According to a first-of-its-kind study by the Anti-Defamation League and the advocacy group GLAD, between June of 2022 and April of 2023, there were 356 targeted assaults, acts of harassment and or vandalism against the LGBTQ community in the U.S. I came here today to give the X-Men a chance to show the world that mutants are just like us. With barely a nod to the notion that there was another side in this 5-4 decision. Including the deadly attack at a Colorado bar. That anybody who now opposes same-sex marriage is a bigot, is, a, is the equivalent of a racist. Protesters with Nazi flags intimidating drag performers at a fundraising event in Ohio. That not everybody agrees with what is now the media consensus. But at the same time, the X-Men and other mutants are not presented as entirely powerless. And in fact, the only power they have is with each other. Magnus, please! Thousands are dead, and more will follow unless we- Thousands more died on Genosha, whose lives matter more. It's a shame then that the mutants are turned against each other over this issue. And thus divided amongst themselves, this house cannot stand up against the waves of humanity's unified hatred towards them. We have a plan to stop Bastion, but we must also repair Earth. Much like how real groups in society are divided amongst each other, turned against each other. There is an increasingly vocal minority who disagreed totally with your tactics, Dr. King. While well, oppressive forces push against them. And I contend that the cry of black power is at bottom a reaction to the reluctance of white power to make the kind of changes necessary to make justice a reality for the Negro. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. Even when all they want is to be left alone and be allowed to live their dreams, humanity can't allow them even that. Often we see people discuss with media, why can't those people do their own thing separate from the rest of the world? As if segregation has ever stopped hate crimes from being committed. Unfortunately, this climate of hate and extremism targeting the LGBTQ plus community is only increasing. Why, for example, can't someone just live in a separate nation that's walled off, isolated from those who hate them? Will humanity undo Genosha? It was just as you said that day in the bar. A promise realized. The simple reality is this. Historically, anytime that what we just discussed happens, 
the people that ran away to find their own place, they pursued. The oppressors chase them to their homes, to their sanctuary, knock down their walls, continue to be cruel even when they've seemingly gotten what they want. It's at points like this that the excuses that people give for their cruelty are exposed for just that, excuses. They hate, and the world accommodates their hatred. Do not mistake Doom's collusion as indifference to flagrant war crimes. Next time I'll send memos. Something awful can happen right outside your door, and you move on with your day. Even good people, like Captain America, as we see, has to do things by the book. This uniform shows up in Mexico bashing heads in with you. It sends a message. That you stand with mutants, unless you don't now. Gotta do this by the book, Rogue. Because they won't break the rules of their society, even when said rules are visibly constraining the rights of minorities. And in some cases, these good people are only doing that because they believe in the dream of these rules. Yet I find it strange how Captain America's and many other pieces of media is portrayed as breaking the rules when he sees they're, you know, they're wrong, yet in X-Men 97 he is not currently. Now, again, this is being written before the finale comes out, but I'm pretty sure I have a working theory that they're going to show Captain America siding with the mutants at the end of the day. They, they, they've, they've set that up too perfectly not to do that, to show that so, when humanity and mutants come together, good things can occur, but, you know, at the end of the day... I don't know. This, this is the end of this video. It'll be very awkward if this guess is wrong, but, you know, I'm leaving it in. That's my hope. That's my theory. Uh, let's see if the show lives up to that. Haven't seen it yet. Hasn't come out yet. We're recording this a few days before the finale. My hands are tied. If your hands are tied, you won't be needing this. <laughs> it's telling in X-Men that Professor X's dream seems more and more remote with each episode of 97, to the point where Magneto has some apt words for Professor X when he tries to talk about a possible future of happiness and peace following the genocide of Genosha. Oh, how I've waited to say these two words to you, old friend. Shut up. But then there's the Prime Sentinels. Humanity has fetishized mutant kind to the point where depowering them isn't enough. We see them try that with Magneto and fail but succeed with Storm. But we also see how these efforts ultimately will not restrain mutant kind. They will break free of these technological restraints. No, rather, by the finale of X-Men 97, we see how humanity, either willingly or unwillingly, are becoming more like mutants, gaining powers of an unnatural variety. The Prime Sentinels are humanity's attempts to become like mutants. Even Nathaniel Essex, the man who is responsible for the virus that turns humans into bioorganic weapons, isn't a natural born mutant either, but someone who was so obsessed over the mutant gene that he turned himself into a mutant. What are you doing to us? Have no fear, my friends. With these transfusions, you shall become more than men, much more. Nathaniel Essex, in the comics at least, is the son of an admiral in the 19th century, whose theories about human defects in the mutant gene, which he names the Essex Factor after himself. Very humble man, Mr. Sinister is. I shall show you! I shall show the world! This investigation leads him to experiment on people and awaken Apocalypse and Sabano, the first mutant. I am as far beyond mutants as they are beyond you. And the first mutant uses celestial technology to mutate Essex into the being we now call Sinister, who continues his research into the mutant gene. In the animated series, however, he does this process to himself. He mutates himself. There is your monster, Nathaniel Essex. Six. When revisiting X-Men First Class, it's interesting how the mutant Sebastian Shaw replaces Essex's role in 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 the uh, in the Holocaust, because in the comics, Sinister was a, a scientist under Mengele. This brings us back to the Silver Samurai in the Wolverine. 
There's clear bigotry at play with both humanity's transformations and the Silver Samurai's actions. We built it to make me strong so I can take what you would not give and transfer your unwanted healing to my body. However, with the Prime Sentinels, it's taken a step further. They've been told over and over that the future is leaving them behind. But I invite them to be relevant again. Many of the people who undergo this transformation aren't even aware of it happening to them. Do these people even know what you're doing to them? Well, I admit the more technical details, but they know they're joining something far greater than themselves. In fact, it's debatable how many people actually wanted it at all. Daily lives with no memory of ever being here. A yeah, mutant flirts with one of them at a local dive bar and... Hard not to draw comparisons between this and the hate pipeline we see now, where people are lured in, either playing on pre-existing bigotries or just given new ones, leading them down a cascading system of rage videos and political tracks until they're pawns of a greater evil designed to oppress one regime in order to prop up another. In the process, their identity is all consumed by a singular hatred, or perhaps several interconnected ones. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! Ignore the problems you face, and if you notice them, it's the other person's fault. With all this mutant loving, people like Joe turn to dial-up chat rooms to speak freely. What's a taxi driver supposed to do when a teleporter gets you there in a blink? They take our job! Yeah! This is why X-Men 97 feels so oppressive. It shows, painfully, the very real ramifications of oppressive regimes. It's why the series works, and why progress ultimately is not a straight line, but something that wavers, something that suffers and staggers and stops. Even after you reach Utopia, it can go backwards. You can slide back. One day, someone will finish what I've started, Wolverine! One day! Kind of sounds hopeless, doesn't it? Well, at this point in the show it is, and at this point in life it is. But, as I alluded to, I'm writing this script before the last episode has come out. So what's going to happen right now is I'm going to edit everything, finish this whole video up, and then add one little amendum, one little addition. Me, my immediate reactions after finishing the last episode of the series. I'm going to come back and we're going to see if my hopelessness has been shattered or if it has been validated. Okay, we just finished X-Men 97. Last episode aired and I have some thoughts. As it turned out, I was probably a little uh, premature with the whole Captain America and the Avengers show up to save everyone. Although they do save people, it is not to save the world and Captain America's input is ultimately very ineffective against Bastion and Magneto and all of that. For only history could be conned into forgiving us. King T'Chaka is right. We know next to nothing about Asteroid M. Series does end with a note of optimism about mankind. The Magneto Protocol that is ultimately used by President Kelly is not one that the whole of humanity unites behind. Um, very specifically, uh, King T'Chaka, I think it's T'Chaka, not T'Challa, uh, Captain America, they all protest the use of these weapons, fearing both repercussions, trying to appeal to the logic, but also saying that this would be an act of cruelty. This is the only language mutants understand, sir. Humanity uh, starts to become more fervent in favor of the X-Men, in favor of Magneto, because they see ultimately that the mutants save humanity from itself. The Sentinels are stopped ultimately by, again, the X-Men. Uh, we don't really see the repercussions of the of E-Day, as they refer to it, outside of a few pieces of exposition. I do believe that Season 2 will elaborate more completely in that sense. But again, you know, you take what you gotta take. Even now, people are good. Too damn good. We see the goodness of humanity, and we also see that Bastion's, for all the speeches, for all his discussions about mankind's intolerance, though that is accurate, he also, he also reflects that human beings are tolerant. 
and thus in order to prematurely stop humanity from attacking him, he attacks humanity first. The mechanisms of hatred are at their at their core limited. You can only hate for so long. You can only loathe for so long before having self-reflection. Ultimately speaking, humanity's tolerance is what drives Bastion, a figure determined by his own bigotries, into a fervor. Thus, to protect humanity, I must protect humanity from itself. He realizes that he is not safe from humanity. I also like how we discuss both Bastion in terms of his identity as a mutant, essentially, as someone born different from the rest of the world, as well as Mr. Sinister's manufactured mutation. I do like that element of it. All this mutant DNA you stole to stay duct taped together, young and relevant. Um, and I like how we see the X-Men ultimately save themselves. It's not a matter, and the rest of humanity. It's not simply that they are mutants who have to fight for their right to survive. It's simply that they are able to save themselves from this awful fate by working together, by uniting. And that's the key thing, too. A lot of the previous X-Men films, as we discussed in the rest of this video, um, divided mutants amongst themselves. But the end of season one forces mutants to unite collectively. I think that's really cool. I think that's really clever. Because it shows that communities, when they come together, are ultimately more powerful than when they are divided. And that right there is a key element a lot of the X-Men films of yesteryear neglected to do. Now, as for what the future holds, who knows? Obviously, we're going to be dealing with uh, in Sabanu, <laughs> the first mutant apocalypse, both in the past and the present, maybe even the future. Uh, we're going to see the greater ramifications of mutant kind in the X in, in the Marvel 90s universe. I would like to see some more Cloak and Dagger, personally, but, you know, that's because you don't get enough of that, ever. <laughs> but no, it's a very interesting time to be an X-Men fan, because we are seeing a resurgence of these classic characters reinterpreted in new and, exci and exciting ways. The Prime Sentinels were never your family. They did not choose to become slaves to hate. But does... The finale of this series changed my core thesis. No, it does not. Because X-Men 97 and the greater X-Men body of work does show that humanity is not to be trusted. Humanity is not the end-all, be-all uh, of society that we would like to see. <laughs> But what it does show, that's very important, what we do see is hope. Hope that in this dark future, this dark world that we live in, people of different backgrounds, different cultures with a common element can unite as a family against the threats that threaten everyone. That when everyone comes together, even against the forces of oppression and blind rage and blind foolishness of governments who act without thinking things through, we can persevere. I think that's something really beautiful. Have you tried not being a mutant?